This week, we recognize Mental Health Month by discussing mental health issues and the many ways needlework can help calm your nerves and clear your mind. Our guest is Kathy Andrews of The Unbroken Thread, and the show is sponsored by Sassy Jack Stitchery. In addition to the new Nashville market releases, Sassy Jacks is your source for the full line of reproduction samplers from Barbara Hudson of Queenstown Sampler Designs, along with Sassy Jack's own collection of sassafras samplers. Visit the workshop section to sign up for the Summer House Stitch Works event, August 4 and 5, and the September Soiree Online Retreat, September 15 to 18. Also, be sure to sign up for the Cosmo Floss Club so that you can build your collection of beautiful, solid, and variegated Cosmo Floss. Make Sassy Jack Stitchery your local needlework store by visiting the website at sassyjackstitchery.com. And now, our exploration of mental health and needlework with Kathy Andrews. Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr. And I'm Beth Ellicott. And I'm Kathy Andrews. And you are listening to Fiber Talk, the twice-weekly podcast for needlework artists. And yes, our artist this week is Kathy Andrews. The Unbroken Thread, uh, go to theunbrokenthread.com, see her stuff, listen to her lectures, invite her to come do a talk at your place, all those things, but we're not going to talk about her work today. Nope. Um, nope, we're not going to talk about her work. <laughs> it's very cool, and you don't want to miss out. Uh, we've done more than one show with her uh, in the past, and go check it out because you will not be disappointed. It's great stuff. Uh, but um, this this show is your fault, Beth, isn't it? I think. Uh, um... I think I think it is. I will I will take full blame for this one. I will because I I noticed it was um, Mental Health Month as May, and I said, Hey, are we going to do? Are we, we maybe we should talk about this a little bit? And that got our our little minds a going. Yeah, that was that was a, another one of those uh, spontaneous plan a show things. Um... Because we we started out, it was going to be a panel, and then it was going to be a something and a something, and it got down to, hey, let's get Kathy; she'll do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, and, and fortunately, Kathy mm-hmm. said, "Sure, I'll do it." So, so we're gonna uh, we've talked a, a thousand times about needlework and mental health and uh, mental health month this month. So, yeah, we're gonna do a show about that. But right up front, there isn't any of us here has any formal training in mental health. So we're not doctors. We don't have formal training. We're just needle workers with a lot of life experience. And we want to talk about mental health and needlework and um, tie in probably some of our personal experiences. So don't, <laughs> don't rely on us. Go see a doctor. If you have mental health issues, go see a doctor. But we just feel it's important that we talk about this and uh, uh, do a show that, that addresses the mental health aspect of, of living, but also needlework. And, you know, when Beth brought that up, I didn't know it was mental health month, but, uh, you know, we, we've just such an awareness, particularly in the last, I think, two or three years of mental health and the impact it has on, on people and, and how prevalent it is. And I, I think, uh, uh, that the pandemic, this is one of the things that comes out of the pandemic is is the awareness of mental health and the impact it's had. Um, you know, I mean, I'll just uh, right out of the gate. My dad passed away a couple weeks ago and uh, 89 years old and never, never a health problem of any kind his entire life. Uh, you know, colds and the usual stuff like that. But, you know, he never in the hospital or anything like that. And he declined so fast particularly in the, in the past two years. Uh, and, and I, I attribute the pandemic and isolation and losing out on his normal interaction and normal activities for so long as a key element that accelerated his, his decline. And and it was mental health, uh, dementia set in quickly. Uh, and then he just declined and, and his body gave out. And, you know, I, I think it's, it's, the pandemic, you know, we talked about that too, you know, the impact of the pandemic on us long-term and what we're going to learn from it. And I really do think that, uh, that it played a major role in, 
ending his life much sooner than it would have because prior to the pandemic, I mean, he was fine. And, um, I mean, he was old. He's 89 years old, and he's forgetful, and he wanted to talk about things in the past, but that's normal. And uh, then all of a sudden he couldn't remember people, and, and um, you know, he ended up in a nursing home, and he was there for not even 10 days, and he was gone and uh, very quickly. And I really think that was part of it. And, you know, the, this mental health thing, I think, has probably affected us all, whether we realize it or not, particularly through the pandemic. So um, important to talk about. Yeah, I agree with you, Gary, and I'm I'm sorry that your dad just died. I didn't know that, and Thanks. that's a pretty that's pretty tough, no matter what the circumstances are. Yeah. That that shift in generation from where you were to where you are. Um, I know, but I, I, com- I commented to my sister. I said, "We're next in line." Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that's a tough one. Yeah. It's inevitable, usually, hopefully, but it doesn't make it easy. But I do agree with you about the pandemic. Um, I think it's aggravated the problems that a lot of people struggled with prior to the pandemic of of loneliness or lack of connection or lots of pressure on themselves, anxiety, all of that. However, one of the good things that I believe has come out of it is that we're talking about it. And I remember not very long ago when if you told somebody you were depressed, that meant you might lose your job or you might lose your friends or people didn't want to be around you because they didn't know what that meant. And um, our mental health is just like our physical health. We don't always have control over it. It's not like we can just wish ourselves better or do stuff to get better. We can do things to take care of ourselves, but you can't take a pill always to fix it. And now we're un- we're starting to understand that. And we're, we're certainly more open about talking about how we're f- not feeling good mentally, psychologically, emotionally. Um, and although that's that's a difficult thing for a lot of people to do, especially if they were brought up not talking about that, it's super helpful to talk about it. And I remember years and years ago, um, we had a a family member die. And one of the things that helped was to talk about it over and over and over to people when they would say, well, what happened? That was so unexpected. And it felt like every time I explained what had happened, that just ate away a little tiny bit at the grief it was almost like, okay, I've unloaded a little more of this grief out of my body into the atmosphere by telling somebody about this, and I don't feel quite so bad as I did before. And so talking about things, I think, is really important. So I'm glad we're taking time today to do that, because I think it's that's really, really critical. Yeah, I think we tend to say, you know, if you ask you, well, how are you? And you say, well, I'm fine. I'm fine. And maybe things aren't fine. And we need to find that group of people where we can say and be honest with them, say, no, no, life isn't fine. I I need to talk to somebody. I need to have an outlet for it and, you know, stop being, you know, just holding it all in and and saying, well, everything's okay. Because I think we all realize, you know, no, for a lot of us, it isn't. It isn't all okay. We all have personal things going on. And, um, it's nice to have stitching though, as this kind of, for me, it's an outlet. And the, one of the nice things about the pandemic what we've gone back to is the zoom. Um, we, I've had regular zoom meetings with a group of friends and we knew each other, but we've gotten to know each other better and, um, opening up more about personal issues, things that are going on in our lives and, and even crying, you know, on, on some of the meetings, um, you know, tears coming because you're with friends and they're your buddies and you can, you can, you know, they're safe. You can talk to them about things. So. Yeah. That's really interesting. You mentioned um, those kinds of conversations in relation to Zoom, I've had the same experience as you and, in fact, made a, a very, very close group of friends, nine of us now, who meet every month. And, boy, they're every bit as close to me as anybody that I see on a regular basis face-to-face. But I think one of the things I've noticed about Zoom is that um, if you're having a rough time, because you're not in the same room that at least for me, I don't know if this is for everybody else, 
you're just enough removed that you feel like you can share pretty deeply. And I'm not sure why that is. It feels like a, if you're with good friends, it feels like a really safe place. And you're right. If it's especially with people you stitch with, because you often just sort of chat about everything under the sun. If you're like, if you're doing an online stitching session and which is really an online talking session when you happen to be stitching, right. something about that, it, it just is so easy to deeply share. And it could be that it's the intimacy of Zoom. I mean, really, even though Zoom is online, it's pretty intimate. You know, it's only the people on that call and nobody's going to walk in the room. You're right. safe. So, uh, yeah, I agree with you. That's that's a big thing. Gary, I wanted to ask you a question about your dad. And if it's uncomfortable, you can say, I don't want to talk about it. But nope, you're fine. my dad died. Okay, my dad died about a year and a half ago. And he was absolutely healthy. He had a heart attack, got up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, had a heart attack, collapsed on the floor. And we found him in the morning when he didn't answer the phone when we went over to see him, as we usually did on the Sunday. And, of course, that was devastating. But what was worse, believe it or not, or not worse, but what was really hard is shortly after that, of course, everybody in my whole family came back to Iowa from all over everywhere. And most lots of them stayed with me. So that was stressful. When everybody left, I was doing something stupid, fell down and broke my wrist. And the consequence of that was, of course, I couldn't stitch because I broke my right wrist. I was doing OK grieving about my dad until I broke my wrist and couldn't stitch. And then I noticed that I spent a whole lot more time ruminating about what if I'd done this? What if I'd called earlier? What if I'd noticed and made him stay at our house that night? And I just, and you know, going back, why did I do this? Why did I ever say that? And I just spent huge amounts of time thinking, you know, really spiraling negative thoughts. And it was because I didn't have anything. I couldn't read. I, I couldn't. I just couldn't concentrate. But I didn't have anything to occupy my mind. And I'm curious after your dad died, or for you, Beth, too, if you've exper experienced a, a sudden death, an unexpected death, or even not, did it really help to be able to stitch, to have something to occupy your mind? Yeah, yeah. I, I can't say it's needlework for me. I, you know, we've talked about that's okay. That that escape and needlework does give me an escape. I mean, there's no question about it. If I can get sit down and just get immersed in it. I mean, it is an escape. Heart rate goes down, you know, nerves relax, all of those things. But what does it for me is, is long bike rides. <clears throat> and, oh, uh, great. And, and that's, that's where I sort things out, out in the, out in the country on my bike, nobody around me. And, uh, so for me, it was where you had the, the release you get uh, with a broken wrist taken away from you. Um, yeah, I, I can just get on my bike and and go, and uh, and I just I just get lost mentally and and I'm able to just you know the mind clears and and sort things out. So that was you know that's that's what does it for me and it does it for me for everything. Um, you know. Wow. And, and and you know Beth has talked many times about if she can't stitch she gets cranky and Max has even told her go <laughs> stitch you know get off my back, but. Uh, for me, it's, uh, if I can't ride my bike when I'm yeah. planning to, uh, that's when, you know, I, uh, those days I, I, my nerves are on edge and I really have to watch myself cause I, I need that. I, I just need that. And, uh, isn't, and it, that's yeah. what it works for me. So, um, and isn't that and great? I'll, and, I'll, and I'll speak to that too, because I used to run marathons and when my son, Sam had leukemia, um, I was at that time running a lot. In fact, I, I just told a friend, I said, when he was sick and I was stressed and I couldn't be gone for very long from his room, I would run up and down the stairs at, at the hospital at Iowa city. And, wow. um, but I, when I broke my knee last summer, um, and I, and I've been having issues with my knees and my back and I knew that my running days were getting slowed down. There was a morning I, you know, I realized, you know, I can't run anymore. I won't be able to do 
I kept thinking, oh, maybe I can do another quarter or half, um, do a half marathon, do a, a 10K or something. And I'm like, you know what, that, those days are pretty much gone. Um, mm-hmm. So I mourned. It was mourning, but I had my stitching. And so I was able to take time and, and say, okay, let's, let's think about this. This isn't the end of the world. You can still walk. You can still move. There is knee replacement surgery. Um, you know, there, there are options, you know, you're not an invalid and, but it helped me work through that by sitting and stitching and, and just kind of calm me down. Cause if, if I sit too long, um, I do get anxious. And so mm-hmm. I might sit for an hour and stitch, but that's about the length of time. And then I, I do need to get up. I need to walk around the house, pick something up, move something around, and then I can sit back down and stitch again. So it was having that broken knee was difficult because I couldn't do a lot. And I had to find a way to occupy my mind and my hands and not get anxious. Wow. So I'm curious, you know, everybody who's listening, obviously they're stitchers of some sort. And I'd be I'd be really interested. I don't, you know, I know that you've got a, a Facebook page and Instagram thing, but I would be really interested how many for how many people when they stitch they go into that state of flow. And we were talking about that before, where you're, if if people don't know what it is, it's where your mind is so occupied with what you're doing that you lose track of time. And sometimes even space that you're just so focused and everything just feels like it's going smoothly and you're running on all cylinders. It's just great. And it doesn't mean that you don't make mistakes. You're just so involved with what you're doing. And children experience this all the time. That's, you know, when they play and they don't want to stop playing, that's why. That's a big reason why. And for me, That happens when I stitch. It also happens when I watercolor, but I'm a rubbish watercolor (laughs) painter person. But I don't care because I'm so interested in what's going on in front of me. And it sounds, Gary, like that's what happens to you when you ride your bike. And Beth, that's what you experience when you did your running. Am I right on those? Yeah, absolutely for me. I mean, you did. You got into a groove. You you just you felt like you could go for it. parts of your body might hurt because you were you were you were pushing yourself, especially when it's doing long. Right. Work. But you got you know you were aware of what was around you, but it just felt good. There was something mm-hmm. um, euphoric about it. You know, the runner's high is what they call it. Even though I would never ran fast, I was always a slow jogger. Um, but there's something about it. And, and every now and then I get that with stitching and I, and it's interesting to me, I don't get it with more complicated pieces. I get it more when I'm cross stitching something, especially something that's just in a a single color that I'm just going Ah. and it just kind of, it gets a flow. I start and I just, I can just almost feel myself just totally relaxing. Wow. See, I get it. I don't get it when I'm doing something simple. I get it when I'm playing around and I'm thinking, what will happen if I do this? So for me, part of it, like with the watercolor, because I don't know what I'm doing, is the process of discovery. of, Mm. And I'm not worried about making a mistake. I'm just curious. What will happen if? And then then I'm just gone. You know, then that's just the best thing. And I know a lot of stitchers really struggle with perfection and trying to make everything exactly right. And that, that sure seems to me to be counterintuitive to mental health because, well, it just does. If you're not a professional embroiderer and no one has hired you, it's just not that big of a deal, you know, (laughs) put it into perspective, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And see, I'm, I'm, I'm like Beth in that regard. Uh, complex stuff that that for me is uh, I mean I enjoy it it's challenging makes me think you know and 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 that is its own experience but the times that I've reached a flow state have been just making dumb x's on linen and just doing it and you just keep going Uh and going and it's just you're just flying and 
you're in another world and uh um yeah it's yeah and it's terrific it it you know it's just the best and you don't want to quit and you you got to go to bed but you you just don't want to and uh yeah and i had that uh, i have that on my bike um not it, it's fairly common. I did uh, last Saturday. Uh, I was on my bike, and just all of a sudden, I hit that spot, like Beth said, where you, you just feel like you, your body might hurt, but you can just go forever. And I had to get uh, back. You know, I, uh, we had a, we had a schedule thing, so so I had to snap myself out of it and head for home, and uh, it just you know made me mad because yeah, because sure. I, mean, I just wanted to keep heading west, and until. You know, until the body said, what do you, <laughs> you got to get home yet, you know, because you got to always right. remember that part. You still have to get home. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And yeah, you just feel almost invincible when it happens. And it's, yeah. 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 I, I, when I think about us talking about mental health and especially to people who embroider and, Many of those people are not 18 or even 25 or maybe even 35 anymore, and they are likely to be at a time in their life where they're juggling about a million things. And I remember I'm just enough older that this and plus both of my parents are gone. But there was a point at which I had my left arm sticking out to help my young you know, young adult daughters and my right arm hanging out there to support my parents. And there were days when I swore that somebody was going to pull an arm off in each direction and I would just <laughs> collapse and die, you know, because it is just hard work. And then you add on to that. A lot of people work either full or part time. It, and it, I used to think, oh, well, women, but not so much anymore because men have taken on Many men have taken on a much larger role in the house. So, and because taking care of a home, taking care of the physical property, and doing all the things that has to be done, it's a full time job. And if both people are working, like if you have a couple of any sort who are both working and you have kids and you have a house, and of course you have to do your meals and keep the car gassed up and make sure you pay your bills and mow the lawn and blah, blah, blah. And at some point, it's just overwhelming. And so, even trying to find two seconds to embroider, it just feels selfish, you know, like, well, I don't, I can't do that. But I think, I just think that's, and it, this sounds really trite, but you know how they tell you on the airplane to put your mask on first before you help other people. I think that's super important because if you don't take care of yourself you're not going to be able to st reach that one arm out to help your, you know, young adult children and the other arm out to help your parents and then be present in the family that you live with. You have to have some time for yourself. And one of the things I think that's so fabulous about embroidery, and I'm not dissing your bike riding, Gary. I think your bike riding is a great plan. <laughs> it's okay. it's but, okay. but when you're done embroidering, you look at it and you go, that felt good. And look what I did. There's a, yeah. uh, what do you call it? A con there's concrete evidence of what you've done. Because like when I was a musician, I was in flow all the time when I played in the symphony and played shows. Oh my God, I could just do that forever and never stop. But once it was over, it was over. The notes were gone. There was nothing. It disappeared. And I have to say, I really like this, this thing of creating something. And then you look back on it. I don't know if this happens to you guys, but I look back on pieces and I know, I remember often that day or what I was listening to if I was listening to an audiobook or a radio show or a podcast or music. And when I look at that section of the stitching, very often those memories come rushing back and they're good memories. And that's another thing I really like about embroidery as sort of as a release. So I don't know if that happens to you guys. Yeah. And I think that's the, um, even I, I've done stitch stockings for all of my children and, um, the one I was working on, I had started it actually before Sam got sick and I was working on his while he was in the hospital. So it has, he actually did a few stitches on it. And when I oh, look at yeah. it, it brings back those memories of 
stitching in the hospital with him. I taught him to stitch at that time. He learned to do wow. work then because he needed something to do. He's like, okay, yeah, you sit here for, you're here for days. <laughs> what are we going to do for days while we sit here? So he learned yeah. to do it. So it reminds me of that, but it, it's not a sorrowful thing because obviously my son is still with me. So it does bring joy to me that he's you know alive and well and healthy but it reminds me of that time too, of sitting in the hospital late nights, you know, watching him sleep while I can't. So I'm, I'm putting a few X's in. Um, yeah. Huh. I wonder if that's why you're going to laugh. I wonder if that's why our grandmothers kept all their stitching stuff and they had, we had piles of cross stitch or needlepoint or whatever after they died to sort through because for them to throw it away, wasn't just throwing away what they made, but the memories of when they made it. Yes. I never thought about that. Yeah. Well, and, and I was just thinking, too, you know, it wasn't that long ago in our history that women would get together and quilt and sit around yeah. a quilting team to finish quilts um, and get together. And you think of all the conversations that went on around a quilting hoop. Yep. Um, you know, talking to friends, the secrets shared, the stories told, the sorrows. And... And I, I'm not so sure men need this as much as women need that connection to other women. Um, mm. I find my husband needs it less than I do. I mean, but he does need it. He just needs us. I, I find he needs a, a smaller group. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm more like your husband. I, I don't have lots and lots of friends. I have a couple very close friends and that's, you know, I'm more, believe it or not, more of an introvert. I do agree that women need that a lot. Um, but I also think, and of course it depends on the man, I think men need it a, as much. I just don't think it's as easy for them to say so. And part of that is because I think in another couple generations it will be. I would imagine that your son will have very a very different emotional adult life from your husband. I, I agree. I agree. Cause he's already said, we talked about the pand pandemic and this same son was like, he was struggling. And part of the reason was he admitted it was there was no one in the office with him. He was trying to finish a project. And normally during normal times, everybody's there, they're looking over your shoulder. They're saying, Oh, you know, you're doing it the wrong way. You should be doing it this way. Let's look at it this way. There was no one there and he was working on it all by himself. Yeah. And very, very difficult time. And, and very lonely. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And, and I think that, um, it made him realize, um, that he needed to make sure he was making time with friends. And so he started setting up game night at his apartment, um, huh. uh, you know, just so that he could gather with, you know, other young people, his age and, um, I don't know, they ate chili and played silly board games until two o'clock in the morning. You know, what it, what a college student sounds great. <laughs> but yeah, that sounds but, like fun. But, you know, we all have that need to connect with other people. And, yeah, uh, I also. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, and I was just going to say that, you know, and I. That's the thing for us. Stitching is that you know, is yeah. our, our connectedness. I, I, I really think that I'm so glad our guilds are meeting again and there ours mm -hmm. meets in person. And I love seeing what everyone's working on. Um, you know, what they're doing, talking to them, hearing what's happening, sitting at the little table and hearing what's happening in their lives. It, you know, um, I need that. I, yeah. I, I eat on that. Yeah, I do. I understand that. And, you know, one of the things we, we haven't talked about, and if I embarrass you guys, I'm sorry, but the stitch hours that you guys do every week, I know are a real uh, focal point for a lot, a lot of people. And even though they may not talk and they may not put in comments, that's a time when they feel connected. They feel connected to you guys. And I think that means a huge amount to those people, a little bit like 
a little bit like the fireside chats. I suppose nobody alive remembers those, but anyway, <laughs> on the radio from the war. Um, but the idea that there are people who get together and talk and they're talking about something you're interested in and you can listen and feel part of that, even if you can't get out of your home because it's cold and snowy or it's nighttime or you don't drive anymore or whatever. And I think that's, I think that's important that's important and what you offer is important and it's different from television. And that's also why I think these zoom stitchings are important because if, if you're like I am, I have to drive two and a half hours to where my guild is. So I do stuff online and boy, I look forward to that every day or every week. I mean, that's, that's important. So every time I can go. Yeah. Well, that's, um, I mean, that's the stitch hours. That's why they continue. Uh, I mean, we cut back to every other week. But that is probably the biggest reason they continue, uh, because they they are a lot of work. Um, to, yeah, for, for that sure. Hour. To do it live, I mean, there's just an awful lot that goes into it to make sure that it's live. And like last week, we didn't have the internet connection go out uh, in the middle of the show. But but it's yeah. it it really is the people that show up every single week, and and you you know, I mean, can't let those people down. And and the oh, Europe, Europe, right. European people who listen the next day, you just can't let them down, it, and it becomes part of of their stitching experience. And so, uh, yeah, they continue because because of the people. Um, yeah, and I mean, we have a blast doing them. You know, it's not like yes. not like right. it's a struggle by any stretch. I mean, we have a right. great time doing them. But uh, but there is that other element that. Um, uh, yeah, I think it does. I think it helps people. Well, we've heard from people how much they appreciate the shows and enjoy them, and and uh, it's just fun and and interacting with the audience uh, through the chat window there is 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 great fun, and it's you know it's just another aspect of enjoying stitching that really you can't you know it's hard to get every week and like you say two and a half hours to get together with your guild. Um, where every other Wednesday you can just sign on and be part of a, a group of people and enjoy what we all enjoy together. So it, it um, I wanted to ask you yeah. guys, you know, cause the, the original, and you touched on this a bit, Kathy, but the, the original plan for this show was I was not going to participate, that it was going to be the two of you. And then you guys talked me out of it because my belief was that this mental health thing is more of a female thing than a male thing, and and it's, it's not a sexist uh, thing that I that uh, or approach that I have. It's it's my belief was my belief, and now you guys are convincing me otherwise. That that a lot of mental health is a result of what you described, where, Kathy, where you, you're getting pulled two different ways, and you don't know which arm is going to give out first. And and women are unique, at least in my view, uniquely positioned in life. To have to deal with, I think, so much more than men do, in terms of you know, Gary. Well, go ahead, Gary. I just, I just do not agree with that. Okay, I just don't. Um, I think we deal with different things, and I think our things are often more. I don't know how to. Do, it, they're more family centered, maybe. Mm -hmm. But I look at one of my son in laws who has a very high pressure job, and he loves it. But the number of social interactions that he has to manage and engage in fully every day, often in with combative people, maybe, or a client that is unhappy. But at you don't you got men or women who work outside the home and are not taking on the traditional role of the carer of the family in the home they tend not to bring that stuff back to their home with them. All that conflict, they feel like they can't really talk about it very much. They need to leave it behind. And that's something people have been taught, you know, don't, don't bring your work home. Don't bring your work home. But I don't think what happens for people who work full time in very stressful situations or even not very stressful situations, many of whom are men, but certainly not all, I don't think that's any less difficult than what a woman who's trying to support her aging parents and her adult young adult children she's managing human relationships and 
And that is hard. And it's gotten a lot harder with the pandemic because we all could kind of be where we wanted to be, acting how we wanted to act, dressing the way we wanted to dress because we were basically alone in our houses for a, quite a while with our family who pretty much loved us unconditionally. So if we looked sloppy and had bad breath and weren't very polite, well, they were still <laughs> going to love us the next day. And now that we're going back into the real world and we're sort of having to put on some filters, you know, we didn't have to have filters when we were home alone all the time. And now we're having to do that again. I think it's stressful for everybody. And I know from my own experience with my husband that depression um, is a very real thing for men, a very real thing. And his was work induced. And and it was very hard for him to talk about it, to do anything about it, and to get it get it treated. So I I I get where you're coming from, Gary, but I absolutely don't agree with you. And again, like I told Beth, I think in a couple generations, like your grandchildren, Gary, are going to have a really different view of all this than we do. Oh, I, I yeah. hope. I hope so too, and and I'm I'm confident of that because I I don't think that this awareness of mental health that we're experiencing here in the last couple of years is a short term fad. I think this is going to grow and and become part of our medical physical. Uh, care regime and you know regimen in in that uh it'll always be part of it um because you know it's the uh what beth you said that you know go up to someone how are you oh i'm fine and you know darn well right. they aren't and right. you know and how do you break through that to help them without intruding is is so tough and i think that that's going to get better and I think we're we're going to find uh, as time goes on and people become more aware of these issues that how are you that you might start getting a different answer, you know, mm -hmm. like I'm struggling, I'm but I'm getting help or can you you know can you help me get help or any number of things where before it was just put up the wall and 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 push people away and and just right. let it eat at you, you know. Right. And I, I think, and I think we need to be open about talking about it. You know, I'm, I am having an issue and I need someone to share this with. And, um, you know, and that is hard to do. It is hard to open up and, and find those people that you can say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to share this information with you. It's painful, but I need to, so I can get help, you know, so you can move forward. Cause sometimes it's just a matter of, of admitting it, you know, I, you know, yeah. you need help, someone to talk to. You know? Yeah. Just like I, when I was talking about that grief before, sometimes just talking about it, telling somebody mm -hmm. you talk your way into not a solution, but into clarity. And, and I also wonder if what might start happening, this would be helpful. Instead of when we see somebody say, how are you? And they say, fine. We say, tell me what happened with you in the last week. Instead of, you know, that how are you fine interaction is pretty closed. That is a really closed statement to say yeah. to someone that you don't have many choices. Fine, yeah, there's, not. there's no options there, right? <laughs> right. And maybe we'll start saying something different. That would that would be awesome. That would be wonderful. Right. So and right. yeah. And it's really, I think also it's such a wonderful thing to be um close to people who share your passion, who and that is, um, that's a rare thing. I didn't find that as a teacher and I loved teaching, but I didn't, I found it as a musician, but really only in rehearsals, you know, but for some reason, and I don't know why, for some reason, embroidery, it's just different. And I, I want to tell you something that's a really cool story. And it, it makes me, it has made me cry to think about it. I have a, a, we have a dear friend who married um, somebody that we met. He, they're both in England. And she is a, a famous embroidery teacher. And he was not. He worked for Ford his whole life. And his wife died. And after so many years, we introduced this embroidery teacher to him on a whim. And they fell in love and got married. Romantic story. A couple of years down the road, we're somewhere at a like a show or a teaching event or something, hanging out, having dinner. 
And he got all emotional at dinner and he said, you know, the best thing about marrying this woman has been meeting all these incredible people in Mm. the embroidery business. He said, I have never known such delightful people. And, you know, that's pretty special. Wow. Right? Yes. And there is something. Maybe it's because we're, we appreciate beauty. I don't know. I yeah. just know that we, we tend to support each other, too. Um, yeah, we do. I, you know, in, um, we had a guild member whose um, home burned down. And oh, dear. I, and she lost, well, she it didn't burn down. She had smoke damage, and she lost all her crafting supplies. So I, we, I think we took up a little bit of a collection for her. Um, you know, we supported her, and she got support, uh, too, from, you know, especially she had a, a closer group of friends, and they were especially they were on the lookout for things she wanted to replace from her stash, you know, cause you can right. imagine you lose, yeah. you imagine losing all your stash, Gary, Jeez. that would be a horrible thing. <laughs> Poor Gary. Don't think about it, Gary. No, <laughs> don't no. It. Don't think about it. But you know, there's, there are things that are harder to replace, you know, that you maybe thought, well, one day I'm going to get to that. And, um, and, and I know that we supported her in that. And then when Sam was sick too, um, the, the guild I used to belong to in Wisconsin contacted me and um, sent a gift. Um, and, and they they had found out and they just wanted to say, hey, you know, we're thinking about you. We're praying for you. Wow. So I, I think stitchers are that way. Um, we. Yeah. You know, we just I think you're we right. Want, we we want to we kind of want to surround each other with love or something. Um you know, if we're yeah, having that's someone, interesting. someone is having a particularly hard time, um, we try to support them. Yeah, but I think one of the things I'd like to bring up that we sort of touched on earlier is this idea of protect perfection. And I know this has been discussed on your show a lot. Um, and I, I have mixed feelings about social media. But hands down, the worst thing about social media is the sense of competitiveness that it interjects into things that shouldn't be competitive. And embroidery is one of them. That and consumerism. It's those two. It drives me nuts when somebody posts something that they just got and everybody wants to run out and buy the same thing and, and they don't need it. I mean, there was this whole scissor thing a few years ago or even a year ago. And I thought, oh, for heaven's sakes, these are embroidery scissors. Give me a break. Um, (laughs) And the the whole competitive thing, people don't want to post something or they do post something on social media and say, I hope this isn't too terrible. And I'm thinking, seriously? Well, first of all, don't post anything if you don't want any feedback because you know there's going to be sadly somebody snarky out there (laughs) but social media which should be this warm embracing wonderful thing too often becomes kind of nasty and when that starts to happen and of course as a teacher I saw that happen with children you know students at school who are being cyber bullied but Sometimes that kind of stuff happens to adults on social media. And I would say if that happens, the very first thing you do is just disconnect. Just don't, you know, send pictures to your friends, but don't, don't lay yourself out there for people you don't know to be mean because they might be. And I think that's really not good for anybody's mental health. Right. And, and I, and I have to agree with you on that. I'm working on a piece in, it, it, it as it um I don't know how to describe it it's in, in my head when I'm working on it I was working on it the other night and I kept thinking oh this is bad this is terrible why am I working on this and I was like shh shh <laughs> why? good for you <laughs> it, it's, it's going to be the side of a bag it needs something else just keep working on it and I will only send photos of that to um my friends um, a very small group of friends because one of them will give me great critique on it. She'll say, you know, Beth, maybe you should add a little more here or why don't you add beads or, 
she gives positive critiques, you know, and the others will say, right. oh, that's great, you know, keep going or whatever. But I would not post it on social media because I know it'll get a snarky remark. I just know because I'm saying it in my head already. So if I'm thinking it. Yeah. I know someone on social media will say it. And yeah. it's like, you know, just keep going. You know, it's yeah. it's not for them. It's for me. What I'm doing, it makes me happy. The other part of that is, and this happened to me in a, a sewing machine, Singer Vintage Sewing Machine group. I, I did a post uh, and had a couple people get all over me, and I still don't know why. And I did the one thing that we always have as an option, and that's hit delete. And yeah. I, I was uh, what they posted was offensive to me, and it bothered me. And I just went up there to those three little dots, found the one delete post and made it go away. And good uh, for you. Done. You know, you just, I'm not putting up with it. I don't want to hear about it. I do this for enjoyment. And, and I think that, that that is an option people forget because you posted, it doesn't mean it has to stay there. Just, just take it out and yeah, good for you. Yeah. 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 So I think that's, you know, we've touched on a lot of things that are really important, obviously, you know, connectedness through our stitching groups, getting into flow in, in whatever we choose to do. Um, and this thing about, you know, staying away from social media or deleting or whatever so that you don't beat yourself up about whether you're perfect or not, because nobody's perfect. I can tell you that for free. <laughs> and I won't even charge for that one. And the whole thing about comparing yourself, which is ludicrous. Um, but you know, it takes maturity and it takes time and it takes inner strength to get to there. And that's really hard for people. I get that. Maybe that's why old people are so cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah you, as you get older, you just don't care, do you? <laughs> <laughs> well, partly, but I think, I, I don't think it's just that you don't care. I think it's that you realize there's no point in caring. Right. Yeah, I guess that's really it. Yeah, it's just wh yeah. why am I why am I wasting psychological and physical energy on something that is just m means nothing in the big picture? Yeah, yeah. That's right. right. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that to to realize that that's that's where it is. That it doesn't have to be super important. Everything in life doesn't have to be super important and completely perfect. It's not. Right. It's okay. Kathy, you touched on this when you said that um, with this um, this consumerism, having FOMO, having what um, other people want, and um, we tend, I think that increases the anxiety people are having. And so oh, yeah. some, sometimes it's just time to say, okay, I am not, I'm not going to watch these people. I'm not going to, I'm not going to look at social media because this is just. It add for me, I have found it's added to my anxiety. It's like, why am I paying any attention to this? I don't I don't want any of this stuff. Why have why am I subjecting myself to this? Right. And but oh no, I didn't get it. Yeah. I know. I so know what you're talking about. It's like her. Oh. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, but all right, so yeah. so what's the approach? I mean, social media is is the way we all communicate and, you know, and, and it's opened so many doors for communication globally for needle workers. Yeah. But then, you know, how, how do you build those, those limits? How do you put those limits in and say, this is how I'm going to do social media, uh, scrolling through Instagram and then FOMO sets in, uh, and then you, do you have to discipline yourself or are you just going out buying a bunch of charts because, Everybody else has them, or those scissors. Yeah, that was that was an interesting little episode. Um, yeah, no kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> you you almost have to sit down with yourself, kind of talk to yourself, and say, "Look, this is what social media is going to do for me, and it's not going to do these other things. And this is how I'm going to use this this vehicle. Uh, yeah, and not let it overwhelm me." Yeah, be more intentional. Because to me, what social media is, is the guy, you know, what what, what did you used to say? Keeping up with the Joneses. Yeah. But it's mm. on steroids. It is yes. on steroids. And we are, for better or worse, that's how we are as human beings. I'm not really sure why 
most people are like that. I'm sure there's a, what do you call it? A genetic reason, something to do with cave people or I don't know, but, <laughs> but, but it, you're right. It's crazy. And, and I do the same thing. I, you know, I read, get up and read my mail. Then I read the newspapers on my iPad. Then I scroll through social media and you can be sure every single morning there's something for sale that I click on and go to the website. And it's like, why? There's not Great. one single thing I need except a cup of coffee at that time of the morning. And I, but I do it and it's, that takes discipline. And I think because it's a new medium and because it's a new thing for all of us, it's going to be hard. It, it's hard. Limiting your time helps. Uh, stopping and don't buy anything until you've thought about it for 28, 24 hours. But I know from, boy, that's hard. If you can do <laughs> Apple Pay, so you click twice with the button and it's all over. But see, right. the other thing is, I used to wonder for a long time, I was a real consumer. And I had a blog for a while called Not One More Thing, where I didn't buy anything, anything for a whole year except food. And it was because I was consuming without being conscious of it. I was just buying stuff. And partway through, it occurred to me that one of the reasons I was buying stuff was that was a way I expressed control. I could go online. I could choose it. I could pay for it. I would click purchase and it would show up at my door and nobody messed it up. And mm. I loved that. I got something accomplished and nobody messed it up. And it didn't have anything to do with the stuff I was buying, nothing at all. And, but that takes a long time to work out. You know, why do you do that? And for that, we often need something we don't have. This is the best segue I ever did. <laughs> uh, and that's mental health professionals, because we all have ingrained behaviors and we may not understand where they come from, why we have them, what they do for us, how they help us or hurt us. And Mental health professionals are the very people that can help with that. And until that becomes part of our general health care, it is going to be an uphill battle because the world is a whole lot more complicated than it ever was before, in my opinion. Uh, uh, this is not going to come out right, but I'm going to take a shot at it. OK, go. Because I've, I've heard it uh, from my own wife and from many other women where you, you go to the doctor and you know, you need help. And, and the answer you get is, oh, this, you're getting older or it's just hormones or, you know, that's just women things. Is, right. You know, and, and I mean, I don't have, have never had to address that, obviously, but, but uh, that has to be so incredibly frustrating to have that be the answer when you know that there's something not right and you really want some professional help. Is, is, that's that, right. is that changing uh, are there other mm -hmm. options? Do you feel like you can just ignore that and go seek out another option? Well, I know because we've been bouncing between doctors. I know at one point in time, this was years ago before Sam got sick. Um, it was after I had Rachel, I had postpartum depression. And mm. so my gyneco my midwife, my gynecologist at the time, she said, well, let's check your thyroid. And it was mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. So she checked that first. And then it, they couldn't, it didn't fix the problem. So she said, well, I can give you something that might help. And she gave me a real low dose of something. But it turned out I had, um, I was sexually abused when I was a young child. And I had oh, wow. totally stuffed it. And yep. this came out after Rachel's birth. So, sure it would. And, and wow. so she was my last child, um, but it was very, very emotionally draining. Um, and then, of course, actually right around that time, Sam got sick. So oh, talk God. about on a roller coaster. Um, very, very um, tough time in my life. But the person who started me on looking at getting help was my midwife gynecologist. Now, she was very in tune to that sort of stuff. And um, she was very helpful. But now, who would I go to? I don't know. I don't have that sort of relationship with any of my doctors. I know that 
a lot of the the new medical help says, well, you have there's this chat bot you can talk to. Well, who wants to talk to a chat bot about something so you know so emotional? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, because it's it it is, and you can't and it just doesn't just poof go away. You know, you no, can't it just, doesn't. That's something you know to work through. It it took years, and and it still comes up. Um, I was going to do. Uh, um, nursery care for my church and you have to do the whole um you know abuse thing and i found um, i couldn't click on to watch the video and i was like okay what's going on here and i'm like oh i know so i'm gonna have to call my church office and say i can't do that it's not that i don't want to help in the nursery i don't have I a problem with that. i cannot yeah. watch those videos to go wow, through that sorry yeah and and it's and it's just something that'll <laughs> be there and um, so when you say, where do you go? I, I don't know. Um, I think sometimes you just have to keep asking. You have to find the right doctor who will say, I will help you. This is what you need. You know, I mean, I will help you find somebody. I think that I have to say, I think that here in the United States, at least in the state I live in, we have got absolutely zero mental health care. We just don't have it. There aren't enough. There, there are no psychologists or psychiatrists at the clinic here in Ames. None. You can get a private therapist. But Steve, poor Steve, he had a thing called, um, I don't remember what it's called, temporary amnesia, I think. Or, he, went, he went out to run errands and I was gone. And I came home and he had been gone for two hours. I walked in the door and he said, I can't remember anything I just did. He said, I know I did this and this, but I don't remember driving there. I don't remember where I parked. I don't remember seeing anybody. So, of course, I thought he was having a stroke. So we go into the hospital. They do all the tests. But when they needed to have him talk to a psychiatrist, she was on a a television monitor on a cart in New York because Mm -hmm. that's all there was. And Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we're, we're trying to talk about things we can do for ourselves for mental health. But the bottom line is that as a society, we need to push to have people who can help us through, who have the skills and the training and know the right questions to ask and the right things to suggest so we can do the hard work ourselves with some guidance. And if there is nobody out there, nobody in your town, nobody even in your state who is available, then that is going to be really hard. And I think that's one of the reasons why our mental health crisis is bigger because people are struggling more, but there is nobody to help them. Right. And I and, wish I had a solution for that, but I don't. Right. And and I think sometimes people turn to um, alternatives. Um, oh, for sure. And, you know, it's easy to do. You know, I remember waking up in the, and, I, and I'm not a drinker and waking up and thinking, I really could use a drink. Oh. I could use some alcoholic strong that I don't have to feel. And yep. And, and I don't drink. So but, it was like. Yeah, you it, wanted that numbness. Right, right. And yeah, so I get that. Um, you know, just keep seeking help is is the one thing I would I would, you know, just keep you, you've got to advocate yeah. for your. I had I did have friends and siblings that had to advocate for me and, and obviously Max. But, you know, you just have to say, you know, this is what I need to do to get better. Mm-hmm. And and. and and back to stitching, it for me, it is the constant. I mean, there was a short period of time I didn't stitch. But for the most part, that's what I do. If I'm feeling very stressed, I'm feeling overwhelmed, I can stitch for 15 minutes and I feel better. And that I was going to ask that question to you guys. Is that your drug? It, you know, it, drug uh, in, a, in a more general sense, but... Yeah, I know what you mean. Is is that it? When when things get really get bound up, is stitching the drug that you run to? For me, yeah, more than more it's stitching watercolor walks and yeah. then whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> and it, well, I say that as a joke, but if I get shocked for some like something really bad happens, that's what I do, and I know it's not healthy, but I also know it calms me down right away. But I know it's not healthy. And we're not talking every day or every week or even every month. But mostly it's stitching and then watercoloring, doodling, you know, art, 
and then a long walk. Yeah. And, and I, notice all of those things are more isolated. And I, you know, I do them by myself. And I think it's because that gives me time to think. Yeah. But I'm True. just distracted enough that I don't ruminate. Right. And and for me, it, it gives me that, it, it gives me a chance to think about, you know, what, how am I feeling? Is this, is this just, you know, a passing thing? Can I, can I do something about it? And if I can, it gives me time to think about what I can do. Yeah. Or it calls me and say, you know, this is past. There's nothing you can do. Take a deep breath, move forward. That happens more often than not, doesn't it? Yes. It helps you gain perspective. What about right. you, Gary? Does that does it work for you that way, or is it really mainly just bike riding right now? It's it's bike riding. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's yeah. good I mean, that you have something. I, 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 that's what does it for me, and and I think it's because in fairly short order, it can, it just drains the tension out of you because of the, uh, of the physical effort, especially around sure. where, I, where I live, where there's not a flat road to be seen. You know, be, I mean, I, I'm up, I have to climb a hill just to get out of the, uh, out of the yard. And, Good uh, heavens. and so it, it, you know, it, it just, it, it sucks that tension out immediately. And then, yeah, then I start, start sorting things out and I, you know, I'm not discounting uh, uh, stitching because I, I get that same thing with stitching, um, but not to the degree that I do with a, with a long bike ride. You know, dripping sweat, thigh muscles are just screaming at me. That that does the, that does the job much more effectively for me. Uh, Good. Yeah. And I think you know it's interesting that we all have things that we do, and I think for the people listening, it's really important for people to if they don't have things to kind of stick their toe in the water and try something they've never tried before and see if that might help. Because sometimes something new, something fresh is just enough to kind of get you through the hump because, because it's new. It's that joy of discovery that you maybe can remember from when you were little, a little child, maybe in elementary school. And it was just like every moment was, Oh, Oh, Whoa, that's cool. And if you, or I don't like that, whatever. But that that gets you out of yourself. And sometimes we get so busy that we we never get out of ourselves. Yeah. Right. And I think that's it. And I don't advocate getting out of yourself using alcohol or drugs. I don't think that's good for us for about no. a billion reasons. Right. But I think getting out of yourself in another way is really important. Going back, by the way, to mental health help, one of the things that people often don't think about, and this depends on your relationship with your pastor or your priest or your imam or whoever, um, don't forget that often people who are trained in religious orders are also trained to help people who are having trouble. And we often, for whatever reason I don't understand, overlook that and there are people out there who are willing to help. Now, maybe it can, maybe it's because they're part of your community and they know your family and you don't want to share all this stuff with them. And I, I totally get that. But in lieu of a, like a psychiatrist or a psychologist or even a therapist, sometimes someone who is a minister or a pastor or whatever can help. And that's something we should remember. And they they often will help without giving religious advice. Right. Yes. If you yeah, if you don't want that, and, and just thanks, say, look, I. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up because I was going to throw in that let let's let's not. I, I'm sure for the three of us, let's not forget prayer as 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 an option. I know for some people it's just not even a thing, but uh, let, yeah, let's not forget that as as a, a key, probably the biggest key. To dealing with these issues. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's right. And that I think that for me is why I go for walks, because yeah. then I'm out in creation. And I think it is really important for us to be out in creation. Yes. <laughs> be, yeah. You know, just remember how lucky we are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. oh, oh, there's there's no question that and that is another aspect of it is that connect, absolutely that connection with nature. You know, the uh, the Japanese. Uh, well, East East Asians in general, but particularly Japanese, have a whole 
uh, system for connecting with nature, and it's proven time and time again what a difference that makes. Even, uh, you know, I, I did a, a thing about when I was doing the architectural magazine, uh, we did a, a series of articles about the importance of people in a, in a building to be able to see nature. Yeah, because that at least gives you that minimal contact. And and then one of the things that we talked about was hospice facilities and oh. how good ones and, and most of them are are designed so that the the patient can see nature uh, from their bed. And because wow. it, it that connection and when you talk about walks, uh, yeah, just even if you just go to your backyard for five minutes, it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's yep. proven time and again, it makes a difference. And, uh, you know, I, and I got to believe taking your needlework out in the lawn chair in the backyard uh, is, you know, just doubling up on that. Yeah, uh, I agree. I love to stitch outside. And I know I like it when we're camping. It's just nice, you know, when we're out and about and hiking and, and seeing new things, um, it does. It 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 kind. It's very. It's calming. You know. It it reminds me of God and and all He's done for me. And it and it and it brings a a, a peace. There there is a peace yeah. there. So yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I think we'll end on that, huh? I think that's a good place to end. I think so. I think so. All right, uh, let's yeah, yeah, let's let's end there. Uh, to the folks listening, let you know, we hope that this helps. If nothing else, increases awareness, gives you something to think about in in terms of your own situation, and um, seek some help if you need it, or at least just be aware as you go through the days that um, needlework and and all these other things can can help you considerably um, get through tough times or just simply deal with the day-to-day -day grind. So thanks everyone yes. for listening. And Beth and Kathy, of course, thanks for, uh, for this opportunity. I, uh, this has been, been great and enlightening. Thank you. You're thanks. welcome.